We know you're busy because we're busy. So, and that's a good thing. I don't know that it's come back to uh, pre-08 days, but I think we're, we're getting there. Uh, and we've also been busy, and we'll get, out, we'll get through some of this a little later, with some uh, code revisions. The state of Ohio has finally passed its sewage rules that will become effective January 1st. We'll touch on that a little bit and how that will affect you. Uh, there will be more of that in the future, but I want you to at least have some information so you know what you need to do immediately here now. So we'll get to that, but also, uh, hopefully most of you all, hopefully all of you, had received in the mail or have filled it out today this, this class behavior policy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I figured as much. Uh, we've had some issues, not with you gentlemen, but with various other classes we present here that have caused this to have to happen. We've had uh, some fights and some <laughs> more than serious discussions and uh, guys hitting on girls maybe inappropriately uh, and, and some rival restaurants going at it. So we had to put that out so that we let you know that we can't accept that kind of behavior or she wouldn't do that kind of thing. So I apologize for that, but that's what that's all about. So today we are going to cover a lot of different topics. We're going to cover updates on the operation and maintenance program, where that stands, some statistics there. Uh, the property transfer program that Jason's going to cover. And I'm just going to go ahead and tell you now, Jason probably was going to tell you, Jason's going to be leaving us very shortly what? for another job uh, with the USGS. But we're going to make sure we put appropriate people in the right places to keep things rolling in that area. Uh, so he is going to give us an update. That will be the last update you'll hear from Jason on this program. Uh, we're also going to cover some uh, code updates, which I'm going to keep brief because there's a lot more to be said. I'm going to tell you about some future training you can get on code updates so that you, have, you feel as, as well versed as you need to be. And then we're going to also touch on spray irrigation, which is a new type of system that's approved in the state of Ohio starting in July of this year. So we'll touch on that. So without anything further, I'm going to have Courtney come up and we're going to get started with O&M. Good morning. How's Good morning. everybody doing? Good. Ready for the rain coming later? <laughs> you can do without it, yeah. I think we all can. Um, okay, operation and maintenance for our aerobic treatment units. And we're going to talk about that for a little bit. I don't have too much to present with. I generally keep the folks that are doing those programs in the loop uh, via email, but it is a good idea for all of you kind of get an understanding and grasp of where the operation and maintenance program is right now and kind of where we're headed in the future because mm -hmm. there is some future changes to that program. So it's always good for everybody to kind of be in the loop about what's going on there. Now, first of all, I'd just like to kind of go back in time here a little bit and talk about our compliance and where we were, where we started from, and, and where we are today. Now, when we started in January 2012, that's when the program first kind of came to light. Uh, we had known 3,500 aerators. We knew that number was a little conservative. Uh, that number was ones that we had documentation in the database and we had right there easily accessible for us. Uh, the, obviously, there were other aerobic treatment units that were buried in the files somewhere, but that's kind of where we started from. And at that point, obviously, you guys weren't sending in all those contracts. So there were many more probably under contract at that point, but we started out about a 20%. As you can see, though, in the green side, here that these are our numbers of aerobic treatment units that has continually have gone up the last two years we're about 4,000 uh, aerobic treatment units now here for Stark County and that's going up for first of all we're putting in still putting in those systems every day um, we are doing pretty good job of going through those old files and finding ones that maybe were installed in 1974 and never made it into the computer and then also as the service providers are going through their list and take a look at other previous customers and now getting them under contract, all of a sudden that's news to us too. So there's kind of a threefold of why that number is increasing. But our compliance has really jumped up here. We're about a 70% compliance rate at this point. When we first started this program, we were told if we could make 60%, good luck to you. Good luck trying to make 60%. So we're awfully happy at this moment to be two years in um, and, and be at about a 70% compliance rate. We know that compliance rate will never be 100%. We're always going to have vacancies and house sales and that sort of thing. Uh, but we're definitely moving in the right direction with that. 
And we're moving in that right direction because of the service providers that are out there doing such a great job. So thank you to all of you that work in that program every day and really moving that program forward. Without the support of you guys, that number just would not be anywhere near uh, 70%. So kudos to those guys working in that. Just to give you a little background on just kind of where we are with the aerobic treatment units, NPDS, non-NPDS, 883 NPDS units. So those, of course, are being sampled every year, right? <laughs> um, now, generally, we get a lot of sampling at the very end of the year. So I think right now, I think I'm about 50 <coughs> NPDS samples that have been sent to us. We house that information. I plug that into our database that they're submitted. They're supposed to be uh, by submitted uh, to us. Of course, that's Ohio EPA. Our responsibility on that end is to let the homeowners know that those should be sampled yearly and that we house that data so that we can pass it on to the EPA. To give you a split, though, as far as discharging and non-discharging, we're evenly at a 50 and 50 split for aerobic treatment units. 50% are discharging units, 50% um, our non-discharging units. So that NPDS number is a little kind of, uh, well, misleading, I guess, if you want to say it that way. The big topic is homeowner servicing registration. I know this was a big concern for a lot of companies when this first started out of, we can't have homeowners out there doing their own servicing. Um, you know, we just don't know what kind of job that they're going to do. I could tell you that that has been a big focus of mine uh, in the last two years is to make sure that homeowner servicing is on the up and up and that those homeowners are doing what they need to be doing. So the numbers for homeowner servicing, just over 100 in 2012, 2013 we're about 276 I think, and 2014 we're at about 256. So that number actually dropped in the last year. I think a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, homeowner servicing, they still have to fill out documentation for us once a year. They have to register with us. They also have to fill out a form, give us proof of the servicing that they're doing, and that we've been really on it as far as checking up on those systems. So that has been something that the majority of my field work is just going and checking with those homeowners. The way that we kind of orchestrated that is that I pulled out all of the discharging units because they obviously have the highest greatest impact on public health or could if those systems aren't functioning correctly those are the ones that I initially have started with and then I branched out and did any paperwork that looked maybe a little bit off um, if you've gone to our website and taken a look at those forms that they have to fill out it's not clear-cut it may be clear-cut for you because you work in the industry but it's not clear-cut for a homeowner so when they start checking that they have an older jet, but they're checking um, that they clean their socks from the multi-flow, that's a good indicator that maybe they don't know what they're talking about. So I also pulled out all of those. So there were a few. Um, this year, we had one major issue, and I've gone through all those kind of major systems, and now we're actually on the ones that are soil-based. So we're just going to a leaching system. My one major issue was a homeowner. It was a aerobic treatment unit that went to a soil-based system, fairly newer system, uh, only a few years old, and uh, he had just never pumped those tanks. and it, it was just a disaster. Um, that was kind of the most major issue. Of course, we all know that man is just really hurting himself with that, that leach field. So I uh, talked with him. That was kind of the, the biggest issue. I could tell you across the board, though, these homeowners are doing their own servicing. It, that's not the case. Uh, most of these guys are retired guys, and they like putzing around the yard and doing stuff. And I can tell you I've seen the most pristine upflow filters I've ever seen in my life from homeowner servicing because they're out there scrubbing those things down. Um, so they're actually doing a, a pretty good job when it comes to servicing those units. So that will always continue to be a focus to make sure that the homeowners are doing what they say that they're doing and that they're living up on their end of the bargain. So just to give you a little background on that. Now, of course, with the state code updates uh, coming here at the end of the year, and Todd is going to talk much more on that, but just how they relate to <laughs> this program with O&M, one of which is that this will widen the certification requirements that a service provider can have. So we probably will see other companies kind of coming into the mix here, um, if they so choose, to work on aerobic treatment units. So we're kind of going away from you have to have the certification from that manufacturer, and now the state will allow other certifications there. 
So we may see that kind of change here in the future um, and have a, a few more service providers kind of in the mix. I could tell you we're at 70 percent, we still have a ways to go. So, uh, you know, there's still more systems out there that need servicing and need companies. If that's something that your company is kind of working towards, obviously there's a couple things we need to do. Ultimately, with operation and maintenance, that there is monthly reporting to me on the service contracts that you obtain as well as the servicing that you do. So if that's something that your company is possibly interested in, you could always contact me. We could talk about that and you could see if that's something you really want to get into or not. Um, it's not just as easy as running out doing the servicing. There is a little bit of reporting on there. So I know for some people that have good office support, it's, it's uh, a, a good way of getting a lot of customers and keeping a lot of customers, but not having some office support uh, can be a little bit challenging with this program. So that's kind of one thing that we may see with that state code update. Um, the other thing that we're going to be doing is we are in the process of putting together an operation and maintenance plan. Um, we are required to do that with the state code that we have to basically not just take the aerobic treatment units, but we have to look at all of the septic systems and have an operation and maintenance program for all of them in here Stark County. So phase one of our plan that we put together is obviously the aerobic treatment unit. So that's any type of system that has aerobic treatment unit, the drip or the spray, uh, so with type four gray water systems in there. So any of those systems that have an aerobic treatment unit, we are in phase one. That's what we're doing right now. As I said, it addresses about 4,000 systems. Okay, phase two for us is a focus a little bit differently because phase one really is service contract and making sure that those routine servicing is done. Phase two is will be non-ATU mound LPP systems like that. Um, the way that we have to orchestrate this is we have to start with the systems that have the highest potential effect on public health and that's why the ATUs, that's been the focus. And then we kind of move down, down the line uh, after that. Phase two with the non-ATU mounds and LPPs Right now, I think we're about 65 systems. So when this really will in fact down the road, um, we're not looking at an enormous amount of systems. But their <coughs> focus will be on just general maintenance. Is pumping being done? Are there other specific things? So those types of systems that need to be done on more of a routine basis. So we're not talking about a service contract. We're just talking about proof of maintenance. So one of the things that we're doing to kind of prepare for that is we've added to our database and our capabilities of our database pumping. You know, pumping records is always something that Kathy, the secretary, had entered in our old computer system, but it was never incorporated in the database that I actually use. So now we've incorporated that pumping data into what uh, I'm using, and then that's going to be starting to be, uh, be a focus for us, that one of these systems getting pumped. So that's going to be more of a focus. I know Phil um, had been doing reminders to homeowners, but that's going to be basically kind of thrown under me here a little bit, and hopefully we'll kind of get that uh, a little orchestrated, a little cleaner than it has been. So that's going to be kind of the focus of phase two. Then phase three is kind of be a big phase. I can't tell you when this is going to happen because it's going to be 35,000-ish systems that we'll be addressing, but all other septic systems. And obviously to do that, we're going to be looking at the pumping and the general maintenance of those systems. With dealing with anything, when you get into the number of 35,000, um, it's going to take a lot of work. So that will be as staffing allows that to happen and as the health department is kind of in the place to do that. But that's going to be phase three um, of O&M. So that's kind of what we're laying out right now. We're in the works of putting together that plan um, and uh, getting that in place for January. So that, that's kind of what's coming down the road here for us with the three different phases. Now I know there has been some interest here um, in O&M to have some shorter term for service contracts. People said, you know, a year is just a little too long just because homeowners, they just don't want to shell out or can't shell out that kind of money in one shot. So what we're going to do is we're going to be incorporating, uh, Todd is putting together our regulations to our county side that <coughs> needs to go hand in hand with the state regulations. He's in the process of putting that together for the board now. One of the things that we have to go to the board for approval is to allow for shorter term service contracts but must be greater than six months. So we don't want to stay away from the uh, two month service contract, three month service contract just because reporting on that is just going to get a little hairy. 
but a six month service contract that would give you one, one servicing during that time, we feel that that's probably a good option uh, for us. So that of course is based upon board approval. We haven't had that yet, but uh, that we uh, probably will be happening here and will be coinciding with the start of the new state code here coming in January. So if anyone is interested in that, and I know we have at least one uh, company that's interested in that, if anybody else is, what I could do is I'll update your report spreadsheet for you to calculate that on more of a monthly basis and a yearly basis. Obviously, you could still do one year and two year, that sort of thing, uh, but we will have that to be able to calculate for you if you need that. So we'll put that in place for anybody who's interested. Just let me know. And another thing that Todd's putting in place in the Stark County Code to coincide with the uh, State Sewage Code is a registration fee for homeowner servicing. Now that's never been in place at this point because it just was not in the code. Um, so what we're going to do is we're not going to charge them a yearly service contract fee. It's just a different term. It's the same thing. Uh, but we're going to call, charge them a registration fee. The homeowners know that a registration fee or some sort of yearly fee was coming, that they knew that that just had to kind of go through the hoops to get into place. So they're very aware of that. Um, and education on that side has been, um, you know, most homeowners said, I just, you know, really, I don't have to pay anything yet. Yeah, you, you will. So they are basically going to have the same thing, $30 per year, and that's going to be a registration fee for them to pay yearly. So that's going to be a new update that we're going to have in there. For homeowners and that way it makes it a little bit fair across the board um, one thing that we've been working on this year doing a better job and I, I think it's going pretty well um, we've had a lot of good success with this we haven't had a haggle with too many people so far but uh, the needs for further repair when you guys put that on your report spreadsheet that there's a system that needs further repair I run a query to show me whether those systems, what systems are kind of out there with issues. When I see that, what I'm going to be looking for is I look for that any additional information. So if there's something like uh, needs a new air compressor or something like that or, or there's no electricity to unit, there's something going on with that unit. If there's an additional information, if I'm not seeing that being rectified in a month or two, meaning there's not included in a follow-up report then I'm going to kind of get on the horn and I'm working with the homeowners. I'm sending them notices that that, that needs to happen. Um, one thing I don't want to do though is you send me a report beginning of the month that says it needs further repair, such and such needs to be done. <coughs> They're planning on doing it. They get it done in two or three weeks, <coughs> but I'm already hounding them and sending them a nasty letter. So I, I don't want to do that. I do want to give that homeowner a little bit of time to work with you and to see if that will be rectified without us stepping in. Uh, but if I'm seeing that that is kind of lagging along and nothing's happening there and I do have that additional information, I do know what's going on. Uh, and as you guys know, I usually send you a quick email and say, hey, what's, what's going on with this system? Are there any changes? Is there anything done here? And most of the time you guys have been reporting those updates to me and that's great. Um, but every once in a while one of those slips through the cracks it's just better on my side if I know for sure that, yeah, no, that has not been done. We haven't done that servicing. The homeowner just doesn't want to do it. And then I know to send those letters. And that has been going on, uh, going very well this year as far as following up with those. One of the issues that's kind of the hard to say is that tank pumping. Sometimes we say that tank pumping needs to be done. We want to give them a little bit of time to get it done, but you know it may not be as critical as some of the you know component issues that have failed. So we may give a little bit more time with that tank pumping, but if I'm starting to see you've gone two servicings and you're still saying it needs to be pumped, and I'm looking at our pumping records and it hasn't been pumped, yeah, I'm definitely sending a notice to that homeowner, okay? So that's kind of what we're going with the need further to repair. Just please include that corrective action to your monthly report so when the guys go out there and they actually do correct that issue, if you don't mind adding that to a future report, that just helps uh, me having to contact you again. I don't mind contacting you. You just may mind me contacting you. So uh, if it's added in a future report, that just kind of steps, uh, stops a little step there for you guys um, on that side. The last thing I'll just mention is we're working on getting together. Actually, Monday, they're going to be mailed the first round 
uh, postcards to homeowners that are not under contract. So we have about a thousand. So we have a thousand postcards that are going to go out. But I'm going to tell you right now that we're breaking this up into 200 at a time. And so it's going to be, uh, you know, five weeks here that we're going to be doing that over. Okay, so we're going to be sending out 200 at a time and we're spreading that out. And in the previous times where we've had to send out 3,000 postcards, 2,500 postcards, we were sending out five, 600. So um, you remember how much you were hammered with phone calls then? We're kind of past that now. So hopefully this will be a little bit easier for you. Once again, though, if there's concerns about that or if there's something going on that if you just think you, you need me to skip a week, that's not a huge deal. Just let me know. Um, the last thing I want is to put myself in a bad position and put you guys in a bad position where you can't do the servicing or uh, handle all those calls coming in. So if there's something else we need to do with that, just please let me know. Let me know today or shoot me an email if you think of something down the road. Um, that way to make that a little bit easier. Our goal is to have this program running smoothly, have the job being done for the customers, uh, and be done in a professional way. So um, anything that I could do on my side to kind of help aid that, just let me know. So other than that, um, my contact information is there. Does anybody have any questions about operation and maintenance? Okay, good. All right, good work. Yeah. Let me fill in a few blanks that, that Courtney maybe just glossed over a little bit. We are gonna touch a little more on operation and maintenance, some of the code revisions. In fact, I'm gonna pass this out. I have 50 copies, I believe there's more than 50 people here. I'm gonna start passing these out so when I get to you'll have a copy. If you're not a service provider, you don't really need this. And if you're not doing the O&M piece, the, the property transfer stuff really hasn't changed. The really, the major piece that's changed here is the operation and maintenance, and it really hasn't changed significantly. What I ended up having to do is because when the code will, basically when the state code becomes in effect, it'll void our county regulations entirely. So we had to readopt them but i've cleaned them up made them clear so that they're just easy to they they pretty much accomplish the same end uh courtney mentioned so that was one thing we the the rules say the board of health shall adopt o and m regulations so that's what that is it also says and courtney touched on this the board of health shall have a plan <coughs> to adopt future o and m requirements so that's what this is be honest with you courtney drafted this i haven't even read it yet i haven't had a chance uh, just because all that's been going on we're we have to have this stuff prepared what you're seeing today and let me make sure everybody hear me that's a draft that's a draft the board of health has to hear that three times and it has to be published before it's established rules so please keep in mind that what you see there it should stay close to the same but if the board sees something different it'd like to have changed it could change it so please keep that in mind that I had to get all that done by October because I have to have three readings, October, November, December, to become effective January 1st. So that's why we're under the rush to try to get all this done. Of course, the code just got adopted uh, September 29th. So we had a very narrow time frame to try to make all this stuff happen. So anyway, the plan is drafted. I haven't read it yet, but we've discussed it, so it better say what I thought it was supposed to say. <laughs> But what we're doing here, you know, she talked about different uh, types of systems we're going to begin, begin to incorporate into our O&M program. Well, we're probably going to do that not based on time frame, not based on in two years we're going to do this, in three years we're going to do that. I think the way we're going to end up doing it is when we achieve 85 or 90 percent compliance, we'll then step into the next realm. Because sometimes based on the workload we end up having, things get moved out farther uh, and, and, you know, personnel and so forth to run that so that's probably what you'll see not really a firmly established time frame on that um, I do also un I do know that the whole concept of opening uh, up for more people to provide service to systems um, some of you like that and some of you don't and I understand that and but I can tell you this we do understand this much that we have to provide good oversight over the service providers to make sure that everybody's on a level playing field. I get that. Because if the state opens the door, which they've done at this point with those new rules, then it's our responsibility to make sure there's not a fly-by-nighter out there that's doing hack work, charging the homeowner. We get that. So 
we understand that, that to be our responsibility and we know we have to accommodate for that. But they've done it. ODH has done it. There's nothing I can do about it at this point. Also, the whole uh, homeowner <coughs> piece, we hadn't in the past adopted a homeowner uh, fee because we weren't sure how Ohio Department of Health was going to handle it. We wanted to see them work it out. We didn't want to change something a year ago and they change it again now. So that's why we held off. Now we know what they're doing and now, and I'll touch on it later, uh, we've, we've adopted the homeowner registration and fees that are associated with that. So we'll, we'll hit that in a little bit, but you'll see that in that copy of that regulation I passed around. So I think that's about it that I wanted to add to what Courtney said. So are you ready, Jason? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There's more copies of that thing I handed out. If you guys, we'll, we'll take a break probably after me. You guys can use the restroom and whatnot. And there's a whole stack of them over there. All right. A lot of you guys know where we are all located at uh, as far as the history <coughs> sanitarians. Um, we, I have a stack of this. I'll bring it up after the break. I'll go down and grab some. Uh, it will change, as Todd mentioned. Um, these are my two townships. I'm not sure how it's going to get broken up, but uh, I am leaving October 17th will be my last day here. Uh, I'm going to go work for the United States Geological Survey, so I'll be uh, working closer to home, actually. <coughs> All right, there's, uh, I think there's been some confusion as far as distribution boxes, diversion boxes, uh, things you see in some of those boxes, and even drop boxes, how some of those work. And uh, I think most people know what a distribution box looks like. It's usually, uh, usually don't see this many anymore. Uh, but uh, it distributes to all the lines equally. Um, sometimes you'll see, if you haven't, if you don't know these things right here, um, those are speed levelers. Um, they are to equalize the flow to all those lines. So if you see those, um, if it's not distributing the flow equally, you know, adjust that if you can, I guess. But definitely don't take them off, because then that's going <coughs> to just have this one take all the water and this one take, and, and that one take none. So. Uh, distribution boxes uh, don't have elbows on them. They, they may have, uh, you know, speed levers on them to distribute equally. <laughs> <laughs> you, you keep going. Keep going. Okay. And once he gets to this, I want to go ahead and cover this a little better. Okay. Diversion box, pretty mm -hmm. straightforward. You usually have uh, one or two fields. Um, two fields is when you would have this: the inlet uh, from your tank or from your tank to field one. Field two. Usually, this is a uh, just slid on 90 degree elbow. With it depends on if there's a riser on it or not. Depends on how much cover there is. But uh, this is what a diversion box is. You usually, see this between two fields. Multiple leach wells usually have these uh, just to rest one leach well, use one leach well. So if you see a diversion box and it doesn't have an elbow in it, mention that. That's something I'm going to mention in my uh, mention in on my certificate because that's something that's going to help the longevity of the system. Questions so far? Good. Pretty straightforward. Now, drop boxes. I don't know if some, some don't know what drop boxes are. You usually see them on hillsides a lot. Um, I see this a lot when I get reports, and some people say um, that the top line, you know, this line here is totally full and saturated, and these ones are totally empty. Um, or moist or, or even dry. You are going to see that. That's what a drop box is designed to do, is to fill this line up first, and then it's going to fill up enough, you know, it's going to go out the side, and it's going to fill up enough, not to back up into that line, but it's going to then overflow into the next line. So it distributes that line fully. I think you want to. Yeah, I want to make sure we're clear on this. You guys who install septic for a living, you know this well. You know how this works. Yeah, sure. Trying to get this recorded. So, <laughs> all right. Let's let's assume. Well, let's let's take this system this system right here. This is a diversion box and distribution boxes. The normally what we would do when there was flat ground, this would be the setup you had, so that this water could come into this box and go out these things more or less equally when there's flat ground. But what we learned over time is that when the the ground begins to have slope to it. This doesn't work as well because it has tendency to go to the bottom line, okay? So what I need you to understand, those of you who don't install for a living and haven't seen this stuff raw in the ground, you may not understand what's happening here. 
So if you're doing a property transfer inspection, let's assume that there's a slope here and you see water, let's say here, but none up here, that's a problem. That water is making its way to the bottom line. We may have a large portion of the system that's not being used. That needs to be reported. Now, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run this. You guys that do this for a living for, for property transfer, you need to surgically implant that tile probe on your arm. I, I, I mean that. You've got to use it because if you don't, you will misinterpret what's going on there. Now, I understand that there's times you don't have records and you don't know. And I get that, but that still means you should probably do a little bit of looking to try to find it. But when you have records, this is the type of thing that you want to start understanding and clarifying so your buyer and your seller know what's happening. Now, as Jason said here, if you have a situation on the drop box and you see this again, assuming there's a slope, this is forcing the water to go into the first line first. So you might report to us, well, I only found water in one line, there's a problem. No, if it's got a drop box, it was designed to do that because it's damming the water up before it comes down to the next one and then subsequent boxes. If you find water in one line here, yeah, you probably do have a problem. You probably have a distribution problem. So I want to make sure we're clear that if you know, if, if this is the situation, it will give you different understanding of what's happening than that situation. So we want to make sure we're clear on that. Now, another thing that can happen on a a uh, drop box situation here is a homeowner could have removed the elbows or could have been done improperly from the beginning and you won't know that until you open those boxes up. You can still misinterpret what's happening unless you open the, some of those boxes. Now another thing can happen is if this has all been done properly and all the elbows in their place like they should be and you go out there and you're probing and you see maybe a little water here, dry, dry, and fully loaded. Guess what probably happened there? Field tile. Picked it up and took it down there, took it down here. You got to accommodate in your mind and your thinking when you're doing inspections of these types of systems that field tiles are all over this county. You drive down the road and you'll see on any given day a truck or a vehicle parked out there putting field tiles in. Well, guess what? We get it 20 and 30 years later and they're still there. And this is the type of stuff that happens. So we need to do probably a little more deduction, a little more time with the tile probe, and you can start figuring some of these things out. And it's extremely valuable for you to have these boxes open, <clears throat> extremely valuable. When you open it, you can see if water's heading down one pipe by itself or if it's what it's been doing inside of there. Certainly you can also see if water is backed up inside the box. Those are all important clues for you to, to be able to do a good job. I want to show you one other incident that happened here lately that will, again, you'll misinterpret. So this person did the right thing and opened up their distribution box to look. Barely any water in the distribution box. But when this was installed, we normally assume, we normally assume there's somewhat level coming out of that box, normally. That's not always the case. In this case, this person set the distribution box higher, the water went out and down, down a slope. So when they probe these lines, they're full of water. But the distribution box is operating at the correct level. You can, you can get screwed up thinking, oh, water level's good. But if you don't probe, you won't know that the lines are completely full of water. So that's where the tile probe comes in. All these things can be misinterpreted unless you take the time to understand what's going on there. Does that, does that make sense, what we're talking about here? Yeah, Paul. Uh, another reason over the boxes that we've seen it twice this month, actually, is an old homeowner that had the system, they were struggling with it, yeah. and they turned half the lines off on the series system to, to dry the yard out. Yep. They didn't have a splitter box. Sure. Which is good maintenance, but if no one notices it. Yeah. Those, having those boxes open are invaluable. Our, our guidelines we've been using is, yes, you need the diversion box open. This is optional, but that's optional assuming you're probing the lines. It's, it's best, it's optimal if you have everything open and you can see everything. So please keep that in mind because we know we've had misinterpretations of what's been happening with the system because of these different things. Todd, on that, is that bottom line, if I get an inspection, I'm doing an inspection, the bottom field is failed, we put another one there. Would you pass that if I note that in mind? 
or does it fail? Well, probably it'll say if it'll probably say something like um, what's that one statement we use? Um, acceptable, but acceptable functional. but functional issues. Right, that's what I mean. That's, what that's I probably what it'll say. Okay. But there'll be a bunch of caveats in there. Basically, what we try to do, guys, is we try to make sure the buyer is fully aware what they're getting. Sellers hate that because they want to hide things. I just had an email this week that said, I just don't understand why you say my system's approaching the end of its useful life. I said, it's full of water. Well, yeah, it didn't break out on the ground, but it's full of water. What do you want me to say? The, the buyer needs to know what they're getting. And he said, well, the buyer's going to think it's, what is bad? <laughs> you know, so anyway, we want them, the buyer, to know what they're getting and make decisions appropriately. So what can sometimes happen is if, let's say, we say that it's, it's not failing, it's not a public health nuisance, but it's approaching the end of its life, they can negotiate. That's what it's about to us. When it's failing, we know that the sellers are usually paying. But when it's not failing, then they can have that power of negotiation with all the facts laid out in place. So some people want it more black and white. Sometimes you all know it's not always black and white, particularly with seasonality and rainfall and so forth. But we try to give them the best idea of what's going on. <laughs> Are there any more questions pertaining to boxes and flow? Okay, so this is yes. <coughs> have had a problem with. Um, I'll make a report to mm -hmm. the homeowner or the whichever paid me yeah. um, of something like this. They will get a contractor out to repair it. Mm -hmm. The contractor person that was sent out did not understand it and said that it was fine. Mm -hmm. There is no problem. Yep. Now I got an awful fight. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, <clears throat> That, I think we do get that a lot. Um, it would, it's ideal for somebody to go out to work, and I do have a, a lot of situations where a lot of the contractors do call me prior to go out and say, what did you exactly say that you want done or you rec require or recommend? Because that way they know exactly what I'm wanting and they know exactly what they're looking at. So, you know, if I want some further review, then they can look at that also. So, yeah, if, if somebody's called out to work on any of these systems, Definitely call us. It's as quick as an email. That's why we requested everybody's email out there, so we can shoot you an email with our certificate, his report, whatever. Yes, Mike. I've also asked if it's possible to call me while they're at the job site repairing, where I can communicate with them exactly what I found. Yeah, a lot of the times they don't have your contact information on the report, right. so I don't know if the homeowner would want to give that to them or yeah. Uh, you know, because I've called you numerous times on questions, <coughs> like I have everybody else. If I have a question about right. your report, right. I call you directly to get the answer so I can get it done. So I'm not sure if they, if the homeowner has your number, I can. If they want your number, I can give it to well, them. Well, I didn't mean through you. I meant through the client. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's up to them. So, yeah, if any of you guys work on these systems and have additional questions, I know Mike takes a lot of pictures when he does uh, these inspections, like I hope everybody does. Um, <coughs> he can pull up some of those pictures and see what he saw exactly at that time. So if you want to call the inspector, feel free. Ask, ask for the number uh, from the homeowner. If you want to call me, I can give you the number. Um, although I don't usually give out people's cell phone numbers, so that's a whole other thing, um, unless right. you guys want me to. But I usually give the number that you guys registered with down, you know, when you guys got licensed. That's what number I usually give out. Because if somebody, if, if a homeowner asks for your number, I don't give them your cell phone number. I give them the number you register well, with. Well, that's fine. It forwards so, to my cell phone. So, yeah. So, whatever it is. But that's just, we don't usually give cell phones out unless you guys specifically have that listed as your contact information. Any other questions? <clears throat> All right. Even before I go out to the property, if I get a property transfer inspection, I, uh, I pull up aerial photos. The GIS, uh, Stark County, uh, auditor has 12, 2012, 2009, 2006, and 2003. That gives you somewhat of a snapshot of what that system was doing during certain periods of the year, as well as different years. Um, this one, for example, was die tested. Um, the house was vacant at that time. Um, the two, this is a 2009 photo. Uh, I'll show you 2012 here shortly. But uh, it was vacant after 2012, and they did the die test, and the system seemed perfect. It 
work fine. You can see that, you know, you can see each of these lines, you know, on that field there. Uh, and just for example, if we don't have any records, um, look at these photos. Sometimes you can see these green lines and know exactly where those leach lines are at before you even go out. Or sometimes you see in a field next to it, hey, there's a nice green strip here, a pipe. Could be a field tile, you know, that's draining all this field away, you know. So some things you need to go look at, maybe even off the property if you want to. Um, but if, if I see a, a field tile or a nice green strip running along there, I definitely go look at it. Because if I'm running water and I don't see anything, uh, sometimes you get <coughs> on there and this field tile is cut right to the front of these lines, you may not see it on the back side, but it's just draining right into these field tiles and just going right off the property. So definitely look for that. But in this situation, it was a vacant house. It looked perfect, no problems. So therein, usually with a lot of these things, I look them up in the auditor just to correct the address, make sure it's all right, but I also pull up photos. <coughs> and this one I saw, okay, 2009, you can definitely see the leach lines. And then we go to, I should have done in color, 2012, you can see it's definitely come up to the surface and started to bleed out here and definitely here. I mean, it's probably traveled 50 feet um, on that last line. So the report didn't say anything like this, but uh, it was a big surprise when I emailed back and said, you know, past, we have past evidence that the system, you know, malfunctioning or not functioning properly. So definitely look for things like this. You can investigate those further while you're doing the inspection. Maybe it's just as easy as when they final graded it, they cut it, it's only three inches of cover on that thing. Or maybe they're right on top of the ground. We've seen that in uh, Mark's area. So <clears throat> once it's installed and, and we're off the property, you know, somebody's gonna do a final grade on this property, it's hard to tell how close they cut this. Thing. I mean, they, it might be you know, eight inches here, but it may be right on top of the gravel down there. So those are situations you need to look for uh, prior to going out. That way you have an idea of what to look for. Questions? Everybody knows this auditor's website, right? And the four photos you can at least get from there. All right, sand filters. It's a big, big thing lately. Uh, we've had a lot of sand filters come across and we've uh, kind of changed our stance on what we want to see there as far as we want to see that effluent quality. Um, I know there's been some situations where we can't see it because it's tied directly into a field tile. We want to see what that quality is before it gets to that field tile. So either a box needs to be installed or, um, or it needs to be observed in s somehow. Uh, so on, fil and so on sand filters, it's going to drain to a common drain line, a collection line, and either go, either go to a storm drain. Uh, sometimes they're sample boxes, sometimes they're, they're not. But uh, we want to know what this effluent quality is. Also, how fast, I'll talk to it a little bit later, but how fast the dye comes out. You know, where you put the dye in, uh, is the dye inserted in the toilet and then ran through the system. Time how long that dye takes to appear in that collection line. Or, um, or if you put it in the tank, then that's going to shorten, it, shorten the time, especially if you have two 1,000 gallon tanks or two 1250s or something like that. So definitely we want to see what the effluent quality is in, in these collection lines before they go to a storm drain, go to a ditch, go to a creek, uh, go to a field tile. Um, so that's the new stance we've taken. Uh, I know there's been some issues here lately. I think Summit County's taken the same stance as far as wanting to know what that is also. So is there questions about this? What are you looking for, Jason? If, good question. Uh, <laughs> we we want to know, uh, definitely, is there an odor? What color is it? Is it black? Is it gray? Is it cloudy? Is it clear? Um, and then if you do get one, like I'm going to go out to one today that the inspector uh, said it was, uh, it was cloudy and it had a sewage odor. Okay, I'm going to go out and take a look to see if I want to take it a step further as far as possibly digging down into that filter bed to see what, what material we have. Is it <coughs> gravel? Is it grits? Is it sand? And also, if it's, if it's a one step further, we can take a sample. We can, take a, we can take an effluent sample and see what those nuisance, see if Did it beats. Did you test the pre coli then, Jason? Yeah, the, the nuisance code describes that. Uh, I'll go to it here real quick. Yeah, so here's some things. Here we go. So <coughs> this is what the nuisance code says. Fecal, 5,000 colonies, E. coli, 1030. So that's what we will look for. That is a higher revised code, nuisance code. So if it's greater than that, then it is considered a nuisance. 
let me <clears throat> let me clarify before you start running out and getting a contract with a lab. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we the public health nuisance standard starts differently though. It says it has to have manifestations of odor and visual. So that's why we're asking you to look at those two things first. What is the odor? What does it visually look like? The additional information helps you make a decision is how fast did the dye move through the system. That's that's just additional helpful information. And then when we go down and we, we evaluate the media, you know, we have just seen historically that pea gravel doesn't treat wastewater. Grits kind of barely does. And then appropriate filter sand does a half decent job. So when I, you know, I've been here nearly 20 years and they were just at the end of putting grits in the filter beds when I started 20 years ago. So that's why we have this kind of balancing act. We have systems from the early 90s that may have grits in them. So we're looking at odor, visual, media, dye tests, and when, when we get to the point where we say, you know what, the odor and the visual making us think that this thing's failing, then comes the sample. And the sample doesn't have to be taken unless the homeowner thinks, you know what, you're full of it, we, we don't believe you. Okay, let's go ahead and do it. Now if we say it's gray and it's black and it stinks and they say, okay, yeah, I can see, then okay, let's fix it and be done. So that's the stance we've taken. We haven't jumped automatically to a sample unless we need to and those other manifestations are there. So I want to make sure we're clear about that. Does that make sense, Fred? Mm-hmm. Okay. You had that look on your face, I'm sure. <laughs> huh? I need your glasses. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. And this is, I want to make one more point here. The, to follow up with Mike's comment about communication. We had a sand filter, and by the way, uh, <coughs> let, me, let me back up a second. On the collection line, you don't have to put a sampling well or observation well unless there is no way to sample it or to see it. So if, there, if it goes into a catch basin, you can see it, <coughs> fine. If it goes into open creek, fine. Open ditch, fine. Uh, however, but if there, we have a lot of allotments, they tied them into some field tile and you just cannot see it. Then we're saying, yes, you gotta have something to be able to visually see it because we're using those criteria to say it's good or it's bad. So, but what we had here lately to follow up with Mike's <coughs> concern is we, we told them you need to put a sampling well or an observation well on that system. So they go out there, I'm not sure who this was, and excavated and put a sampling well on that pipe right there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so we said, oh, no, 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 no. And of course, the homeowners just ticked off because it's our fault, you know. <laughs> well, always is. Yeah. yeah. So communication is, you know, if an installer would have done, I think they would have known, but I think this guy was not. And he was just putting a sampling well on for this guy, and he, he put it on the distribution pipe. He said, no, you got another about three or four feet to go before you're in the right spot. So anyway, again, communication is so critical. Jason? Yes? A lot of these that we find, they're down three feet. You've got 18-inch maximum. You can't change it. it. Three feet as far as the collector Where's line? The all the cover. <coughs> Paul, that was, from, that was from code. That, we're, not, we're not after cover. Right, this is this really is a deep. spec that came out of the old '94 code, just so right. you get a visual on it. We're oh, not okay. out there yeah, evaluating cover. Anything. That's goofy. So. What's that? So it's goofy to skin it, so I'm yeah. asking. No, no we're we're not out there to like pound on people about cover unless it's not. <coughs> yeah. Any other questions? Uh, another time we may want a some type of sample port is if uh, Todd was saying some, but sometimes you have an allotment or it, it's tied into the storm drain in front and there's no catch, it's not tied into a, t a catch basin. The catch basin is <coughs> four houses down. So who knows what junk you're collecting from <coughs> 12 houses above you. So that's why we want to know specifically what that property is. Sand filter there here, this is one that's split. So you, you know this one where you have a flow diversion just an example, I went over this last time. So you have a flow diversion there at the top to once again arrest those separate sand filters. Now, I just want to go into a sand filter is different from a leach bed. A leach bed does not have a drain on it. If you see uh, where it's written in the report where it's supposed to be a leach bed and it's going to a creek somewhere, somebody probably tied some type of pipe into that after the fact. Leach beds do not 
discharge. It would also be pretty black. Yes, yes, because it doesn't have the amount of, well, some of the filter beds don't have that much either in it. Well, this, yeah. Yeah. yeah, some of those are yeah. nasty too. All right, we had some issues here. Uh, <clears throat> Pumping the systems. I know the homeowner may tell you, yes, I pump my tank and so on and so forth. Tanks are one thing. Um, you need to also know if they pump the leach well. Um, if they pump the leach well prior to you coming out and it only has like one foot of water in it and you run your test and it now has two foot of water in it, um, it's kind of misleading. Uh, you try to look for some type of uh, indication that that leach well was full at one point. Because we had someone where it had five foot of airspace left in that leach well, and all of a sudden somebody moved in, and three weeks later it was full and it was backing up. So I think homeowners, realtors are learning what we're looking for yes. and why we're looking for it. And they tell the, their homeowner, yeah, pump that leach well. And, and all of a sudden their, their tank's full and it's overflowing in the leach well. They have a foot of water. Okay, it looks great. But do we know that they pump their leach well? They may or may not tell you that. So if you can figure out, I know some homeowners can be deceiving, like I said, <laughs> sellers want to sell the property, buyers want to know what's going on. And uh, that's one reason why we want to open up leach wells and figure out what the effluent level is. But if you go there and a leach well is exposed for you, was it pumped prior to you coming? Was it not? So those are things you need to look for. Questions about that? So why we locate leach wells, I get this a lot from homeowners, a lot from realtors. Um, we've been doing this uh, for a while. Um, we locate them because it gives us a better picture of how that system is functioning at that time. Uh, we may not open it up. We've done this before. Uh, uh, a service provider did the test. Everything looked fine. Nothing backed up. We required, required it to be open. They open it up and it's all the way up into the riser. It's three feet below the ground, it's a foot into the riser. You know, how long will it function like that? I don't know, it may be functioning like that a while, but at least we can explain that to the buyer of what, how it's functioning at that time. So that's why we open them up. It gives us a, a much better picture of the functionality of that system. Any questions? I think we're hopefully we're all on the same page there. Why don't you just require they be open? Instead of may or may not, why don't you just require they're open? Well, we, we do require it. I don't, I don't sign off on that certificate unless they're exposed. Right. Yeah. To make it bring risers up and grade and everything else? Well, we don't do that, but if they, I, sometimes they say recommend adding risers because okay. some people don't want to pay that extra $300 or $200 to put right. that right. pipe on top. Take it away from the profit, maybe? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> exposing is one thing. Uh, the risers, it would be ideal. They can monitor it then, pump it when they pump their tanks. But whether people, whether that buyer wants to spend the extra $100, $150, $200 to do that, that's that. Any other questions on leach wells? <coughs> Tile probe, like Todd said, have that thing surgically attached to your hand. We, we have many sanitarians here that hurt their backs doing this. So for, you know, we, we probe 45 minutes trying to find these leach lines, trying to find how full they are. Uh, probing for risers on leach wells. Um, sometimes the leach wells have risers, some of them don't. So probe, probe, probe. It tells you great things as far as the effluent levels in these trenches, uh, how deep trenches are. Um, that's something worth noting. You know, that's why we have it on our list, you know, effluent level or trench depth. Because if the permit says they're only supposed to be 12 inches deep and all of a sudden we see that they're 36 inches deep, you know, that may tell us you know, as far as the functionality of the system. So please probe. Um, it tells us so, so much. Hydraulic loading, I know I talked to this about the last two times here. Um, most, most distributors of aerobic treatment units do not want you <coughs> hydraulically loading slug into 180 gallons at them. Uh, they're not designed to do that. Um, you're going to get alarms. So please, uh, if you do have an aerobic treatment unit, Maybe run a little bit of water through, through the house to see that, yes, it is flowing from the house to the trash trap. And then after that, run a hose, if possible, hopefully run a hose to the lift station, to the distribution box um, for the remainder of your 180 gallons or 200 gallons or whatever you guys want to run. That at least prevents us from pushing bacteria, unwanted solids, uh, alarms going off. Because what happens is we get alarms 
you know, somebody says, okay, I loaded 180 gallons, high water alarm went off. Is that what it's supposed to do? I mean, it's supposed to hold back water so it's treated properly. So definitely, if, you're, if you have a jet, if you have an AquaSafe, any of those uh, multi-flow, please hydraulically load from uh, the pump tank, if you can't get to a distribution box or if it's a zone valve, pump tank or distribution box, diversion box, whatever you go. Questions on that? Once again, I talked about picture taking. If you have pictures, pictures of filter, uh, filter beds, the discharge, if you can take a picture, I know we can't get the odor, but if you say, look at that, it's puking out black stuff or gray stuff, uh, take a picture of that. That way, I don't have to make a trip out. The sanitarian doesn't have to make a trip out just to make that call and say, yes, it is failing, is it not failing? Same thing about uh, possible failing leach lines. Is it saturated and bubbling up to the surface and flowing? Take a picture of that, that way, and send it to me. I have no problem with that. I can include it in the report that way. It's always in our system, and whoever gets that report after me, they have it also. So pictures are great. So if you take them, especially in problem areas, take a picture, send them to me, please. Do most of you take pictures when you do the inspections? And if, like I said, if you have any issues um, that are questionable, especially if you think I'm gonna have a question with them, just uh, attach those to your email you send me. <clears throat> Accurate property transfer inspections. Make sure you fill them out you know, describe as much as you can. Some people fill out all my lines on page two and even more, you know, right in the, in the margins. Describe as much as you can. The better description you can give me gives me an idea of how that system was functioning as you were testing it. So definitely write as much as you can. Make them accurate. Uh, tell me what that water level was from the inlet, from the, from the lid. Uh, you know, did it, did it back up? Where did it back up at? Stuff like that. Where did it surface at? Draw on your diagram where it surfaced at so we can go out and accurately see where it did. Once again, 77 aerobic treatment units. There was rules after that. Um, anything pre-77, um, we uh, would like at least some, this is when Laura was here, we'd like to, to have a sample to check for that nuisance level. Most of these pre-77 aerators aren't functioning the greatest, they're usually falling apart, there's no motors in them, and there hasn't been motors in them for 20 years, so usually those eventually all get replaced anyway, because they're just puking out nasty stuff. <clears throat> okay, the history of ATU. Sometimes we see upflow filters, French drains, sometimes you see, okay, there's, a, there's an old jet, and it goes to uh, a French drain, 300 feet of it. You might not even see a discharge while you're there running your 180 gallons. So definitely uh, know what type of system you're working with. If you have a question, call the sanitarian, call me. Um, but like I said, some of them are French drains, some of them are upflow filters to direct discharges. Just be wary of times have changed, systems have changed, and how we discharge has changed also. Once again, I, I email certificates back to the inspector. Uh, you're responsible to distribute it. Sometimes I do get calls from realtors prior to me even looking at your report or prior to getting your report and they want a copy of it. So I usually CC them on the same one I do you just because it is public record. Okay. Um, one thing, uh, we haven't had any revision of the property transfer form probably for about a year now. Has anybody, everybody like the way the form looks? Want to add something, take something away? Probably not, but add something. Uh, is there any questions on the report? Would you like to see anything changed on it? Great. Uh, once again, check boxes on number uh, uh, on page three. Check those boxes. Uh, we've had some people that aren't checking those boxes. There a reason why. Um, I think it's the last one before you get to all the check boxes. Uh, I think it says uh, functioning properly, but. Uh, see below comments. Is there a reason why you're not checking is functioning properly? Is it because you think that you don't want to differ from what I say or you don't want uh, the realtor coming back on you saying you said it was great and then the health department says it was horrible? Is, that, or is there reasons why we're not checking all those boxes? Anybody in particular? Because <laughs> we see that a lot. You check all the caveats, the 25, 20, 25 years, you know, change of occupancy, pump the tank, you know, get a service provider, but 
you don't check that box that leads to all those. So we want to see that box checked if you check all those caveats. Uh, if you have questions, we have some people uh, call before they submit the report saying, hey, this is what I have. What's your thoughts on how you're going to respond to it? That way we're on the same page. If that alleviates uh, you from possibly getting yelled at, if you were on the same page prior to reporting, that's fine. Uh, call, like, it gives me a heads up of what's coming in then. But uh, we need to check the boxes uh, on those reports. That way you guys make a stance. And uh, it's the way it's functioning as you were there. So is it functioning good? Okay, it's, fun it's not causing a nuisance. We have the nuisance code. I'm sure you guys have the nuisance code. If it doesn't meet one of those, then go ahead and check that is functioning properly and put all the caveats. We haven't seen, uh, I don't think I've seen one of these come in. Um, Mound property transfer inspections, I know we went over this. I think that's still on the web probably, that mm -hmm. inspection form or the inspection of those. So if you're doing a mound inspection, make sure you have those squirt tubes and check the squirt heights and all that stuff. Are there any pine tree, pine tree mounds left? I don't need to there was <coughs> there's probably six to eight of them that ever went in. Well, they're still there. Mm -hmm. They're still there. Right. That's all that ever so if you do a mound property transfer, make sure you do those requirements. I think it's listed even in on our website on the requirements, but make sure you do the sport heights and all that other stuff. We can just give them to you, can't we? Give them what? To you guys. Give it to us to do those? <laughs> no. <laughs> yes. Since you're um, requiring it on mounds, are you going to require that on your LPPs? It should be. It should be, yeah. I haven't seen too many of those come in either, so. Yeah. So any of those that are required, um, the squirt height tells us a lot. It tells us how, you know, how clogged those, that line is, then how much maintenance that homeowner's been doing. Well, so do you have some kind of training for some of these? Uh, there is instruction manual. I think Debbie did a form on uh, a whole form on how to maintain your mound, and that's on our website. The homeowners can print those off. There's videos. I had the one video of me uh, doing one over on the Paris. For the LPP. Is, that a is there what? <laughs> instructions on how to do the inspections on the LPP. I think that's probably on it's, the. It's in the manual, but it's also in that in that mound yeah. uh, video for us. It, it's the same thing. That's one thing, but for some of the people. Yeah who are not installers. Yeah, service providers. Service providers can go in and do them LPPs to yeah. test that. Yeah. Are they going to know what they have to do? In the the education's thing? available. They need yeah. to use it. So if they yeah, don't know, we have offered to any one of you on an LPP, if it's your first time, and you're not familiar with it, to come out and help you do that with you. So we offer all of that. Education's available, but you have to use it. Now, if, if it comes in and it's all goofed up, we're going to turn it back and say, do it right. Finish the report. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Flout. Uh, I don't know if anybody, I know some have been installed. You guys may not know what those are. You may see them as you start. Uh, those are alternative to having a pump. Uh, it's just, uh, it's, a, it's a tank of water. Uh, it's usually a tank and then it has an arm that drops down. It doses leech lines. We have one that doses a mound. Um, so there's many flouts out there. So I don't know how many, how many you think are out there? Doesn't. Okay, so there's not that many, but when those trans when those start to transfer, just know what you're looking for. Um, it's it's an alternative to uh, having a pump. Invoicing. Courtney does all the invoicing. Make sure you guys are opening up your mail so you can pay those invoices. Uh, it helps if Courtney does not have to send multiple notices out that you're past due. So. Pay your invoices, and if it comes too far or too far out, I'll just stop reviewing them until it's paid for. All right, this is, I'm not, hopefully nobody has had any problems, but this is a, to air your grievances, I guess. We're scanning all of our records downstairs. We have none of our records that are in those uprights downstairs are gone. Uh, they're currently being scanned in, and they will be available, the permits will be available to the public. So hopefully at one point uh, you guys can get your own access, right? Yeah. You'll get on your own little login. You'll be able to log in and get any of the per any of the permit information, water well permits, septic permits. You'll be able to get all that information and print them out before you even go out. You won't have to request from Kathy anymore. Oh, that would be right on. Now, has there been any <laughs> yes, Paul. nuisance complaints? So we know if we're nuisance complaints won't. You'll still have to request those records, but you'll be yeah. 
How soon? He'll probably address how soon those. Is that going to happen? Uh, they're being scanned. We probably have another what four weeks or so, possibly. Probably, yeah. Possibly another four weeks, but all those records are out. If you do request, and hopefully you guys have, I sent that email out to everybody with that letter stating that they're going to be gone and maybe do it. To, you know, request them about a week or so in advance, or maybe a little less. Um, has everybody been getting their records on a timely manner? Mm -hmm. For the most part? You're outstanding. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You need to talk to the other counties. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, good. And I think maybe some of the other counties, and Todd may talk about this, some of the other counties may start doing what we are doing, you know, as far as the records. It'd be nice if Summit County get in with technology. We want you to fax it over. Yeah. Uh, well, and that's what. Um, that's why we wanted to email addresses uh, because it's so much easier for us with the, especially uh, with nuisance complaints the other ones are going to be online for you to print out yourself but nuisance complaints it's easier for us to just attach those to an email and email those to anybody but we have to as far as HIPAA rules we can't uh, just give nuisance complaint public record so they have to be selected we have to look to see if anything needs to be retracted or not in there mm -hmm. so all in all, scanning and record request is going fairly smooth. Mm -hmm. Good, good. I think that might be it. Yep. Next meeting, though, Todd will talk about this. It's coming up in a month. Uh, we're going to do it in a month because it's hard for Courtney to get everything online for licensing and all that other stuff. So the next meeting is going to be November 21st, 8:30. Uh, I'm not sure. Mark is in charge. He'll be sending out notices or letters. I assume they have to do that for each meeting. You do, unfortunately. Okay. You'll be getting the same packet. So you'll be getting that same packet to fill out this thing here, right? Yep, your behavior notice. Bad one for So, yeah. yes. So that'll be getting sent out as well as what's going to be, and that'll be probably go out late, late October, early November for the next meeting. And it's going to go over the sewage code as well as uh, spray systems. And he's going to go over that. We're going to have a couple of those go in in the county. So we're going to have, hopefully, videos, photos, and I'm sure there's going to be some other topics. I won't be here. <laughs> You're a quitter. <laughs> uh, certificates. <laughs> Thanks, Fred. <laughs> certificates are uh, at the end of class. We'll have those if you pre-register. If you did not pre-register, and pre-register probably means if you had one of these filled out. If Kathy got one of these done, she will have a certificate for you. If not, um, she'll just mail it to you. All right? Any questions? Good. All right. Now, I want to, once again, we've said this many times before, the, you can download this if you're curious, and it says it right on the form. You're, it, when we're talking about property transfers. A public health, what we define as a public health nuisance, we turn back the form to you, is going to be in accordance with 37... 18.011. So if you have any of these criteria, then you can feel safe to say, I saw a public health nuisance and checked the proper box on the form. So this is what we're using, this is what you should use. I, and I'll add to that, if it's a public health nuisance or imminent public health nuisance, meaning you ran 30 gallons and the tank was this far from overflowing, it's going to happen, but you decided not to flood it all over the yard. So, or risk of backup plumbing. Or yes, yes, or risk of backing up into the house. So if you stop for a good reason, it's still a public health nuisance in our eyes because it was going to imminently fail. Uh, but that's what we're using, so it's the same criteria you can use as well. So have that handy. Yes, go ahead. You can still transfer property though, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. What, good question. I want to make sure we're clear about that too. We do not stop the transfer of the property. We want the buyer to know what he's getting. And we want them to know that if you, if you have a failing system, it will be followed up on, whether it be with the seller or buyer. We don't care. But it's got to be fixed. So we don't care who fixes it. We don't care if they transfer it. But they need it to know. Now they know and they need to make provisions <coughs> to get it fixed. Yeah. If, it's, if it's failing and the buyer buys it knowing that, the sanitarian, whoever has that area, is going to go after that buyer. The seller's out of the question at this point. So. The way I've explained it, Jason, me and you've had this conversation before. When I send out my emails with a certificate of review, mm -hmm. I label them for the agents and I call them open mm -hmm. certificate of review, meaning there's issues, recommendations, or requirements are on the county radar. Mm -hmm. And they have a review date on them, not the drop down where it says final, final review. Yeah. That way they can never come back and say, oh, we weren't aware there was something open or pending in the county status.
So, but if you've issued that final approval date on it, I just label it certificate of review. Yeah. I flag it for them, and, fl and that's part of me flagging it so I can Correct. have a flag on it. And yeah. I've emphasized to them they can transfer, but there's items, buyer beware, that need to be addressed. And when you address them, we'll report them back to the county for you. Correct. I mean, it, any required items, if there's a required item, most likely you won't see a signature, you know, my, my sign off at the bottom of the page. Right. If it's a recommendation, I know some, uh, some banks require even our recommendation to be done. I mean, so be it. But if it's a recommendation, I'm going to sign off, I'm going to final it. If it's a requirement, it won't be signed off on until those requirements are done. Whether it's further review, whether it's a leach well, whether it's filter bed, <coughs> whether it's a new system. They're just, they're just getting confused where you got the top line that says review date, mm -hmm. then you drop down and you'll see that final approval date. Mm -hmm. That's what's throwing them. They mm -hmm. think they've got to have that final approval date on there. Mm -hmm. And that brings up a good point. Um, if, if somebody is doing an inspection, uh, one of you guys are doing an inspection or an installer is doing an inspection, and you're going to, there was a problem with the system, and you're going to fix the problem, send me the report prior to even fixing the problem. It may take a week or two to get that problem fixed. Because people are calling me what the problem is, what it's not. If At least if I have the report say, stating what the problem is, then I can give them something that this is what needs fixed. That person that did the inspection is going to fix it. And that way, so if you do the inspection, turn it in, even though it's going to be fixed two weeks later, send me that revised uh, report later. Do you want two reports then if we do that? Yeah, if, okay. if, if there was one that, not necessarily two reports, if, if you're just replacing like, um, you know, a, a box is totally just falling apart and destroyed. Okay, needs to be replaced. Yes. Okay. So send me that report stating that it's it's not running, or you know, and then send me just maybe uh, you know, it doesn't have to be a whole report. Okay. Yeah, a receipt stating, hey, I was there at this date, replacing the pump, you know, is functioning properly at time of inspection or something like that. That's good enough for me. Okay. I I don't need those four pages back again. With okay, all you don't the need refilled out. Nope. Just just make sure you email me with the. <laughs> Just make sure you email me with the address, make sure it's on the receipt, and state exactly, if it's you guys replacing it, make sure you state exactly what you did. I don't want vague stuff. We have this sometimes with plumbers. That's the only reason I'm asking. I didn't know what you want. Yeah. Well, we, we have this with plumbers with reroute plumbing. We're like, rerouted it where? Is it to the exterior? Is it still going to the septic system? <coughs> stuff like that. Yes. So... Make sure if you send us something, make sure you're as descriptive as possible, and that's usually good enough. We'll, okay. we'll correct it at that time. Any other questions as far as those reports and repairs, required repairs, further review? Okay. Are we, are All right. Well, let's go ahead and take about a 10-minute break, and we'll start back up in about.